Thanks so much, Offa, for that beautiful introduction, and thank you all for coming out today. It's awesome to be here in WA for the first time in a few years, and um, this could be a good or a bad thing, but this is my first keynote speech ever. <laughs> um, I've never been asked to give a keynote before, even though I've been on um, radio and TV now for 10 or 15 years, um, I've mostly been asking questions or telling other people's stories, um, which has been an amazing experience, but I've never told my own story. And um, hearing about the struggles of some of our listeners on Hack, um, the things we go through as we grow up and we find our place in the world, I could relate to so much of what people were saying and we'd get these amazing talkback callers who would just spill it all out for the first time and you could hear that in their voices as they told their stories. And so often I could relate to the stories about mental health or, or family or in my case, uh, religion. But I always sort of just, just stayed right in behind that little line of impartiality and let people tell their stories. But eventually I've, I've come to the point where I've wanted to talk about my own story and to do it properly in context and in detail, um, which is what books are great for. So here I am. Um, First keynote, it could either be a very bumpy ride, but on the other side, um, a lot of these thoughts and stories I'm talking about um, for the first time. So you're getting it fresh, first time here in WA. So the life I ended up getting to live um, was not just beyond my wildest dreams. These were things that I couldn't even dare to dream about. To be able to speak to some of the world's most important people like Sir Dave, um, to get to debate publicly society's most interesting and important issues in the media was just absolutely incredible for me. And then there were some other adventures that came into my life like somehow ending up in an 80s pop retro group <laughs> that was touring the country for years on end. Um, this is from Splendor in the Grass in 2017, main stage Sunday night. Um, we got to play basically every festival, almost all of them twice, and I just never expected that. Um, I've been able to just meet amazing people, um, make amazing friends, go to some ridiculous parties, um, and most of all, and this is probably the bit that I never really expected, to be able to express my true self in all of its messy, silly colour. And then finally to be able to actually share my story in a book and for people to actually take an interest in it was beyond where I saw my life going because this is a, more of a representation of where my life began. This is me 10 years old in a backyard baptism tank being baptised by my dad who was my local pastor. Um, and this is in um, Mudgee in the central west of New South Wales, a town of about 7,000 people. And we were taught to be humble, to lay up your treasure in heaven, that the meek would inherit the earth, and that the things of this world were kindly minded and at enmity with God, and that our focus should be on God, the Holy Spirit, and growing the church. So to get from this point to this point, there was a very uncomfortable, difficult truth um, in between. <clears throat> and part of the reason I was so happy to come over and, and speak here was the theme of the festival disrupted this year about the cost that comes with truth. And any difficult truth comes at a massive cost. And what I want to talk about today is how the costs for me were quite clear. I think our basic hu human survival instinct makes us very aware of the costs and the risks and the threats in our lives. The benefits, I couldn't, I couldn't see them. I couldn't understand them. There was darkness out in front of me. But as I'll explain, the benefits have been infinite and they're still rolling in today. They've unlocked my own personal freedom and life, unlocked my family, which was a massive surprise, and 
after telling this story publicly, the reactions I'm getting from people are showing that it's unlocking the burdens of other people too. These are all things I never could have expected when I was making that trade-off of whether to speak out about my own truth. So, this is where it all began. Born in Dubbo, 1981. I've always had a massive head, so once the doctor put away the forceps, uh, these two beautiful parents, um, Andrew and Prue Tilly, brought me home to a white weatherboard cottage a couple of blocks from the main street in Dubbo. <clears throat> there were two more sons, that's Sam and Alexander. I decided at the age of five that Alexander didn't suit him and started calling him Buzz, and it stuck. <laughs> Funny story, actually. There was a movie around that time called Willow, and the biggest kind of neg in that movie was Peck, Peck. So when Buzz wasn't quite landing on Buzz, I started calling him Peck, and my parents were like, let's stick with Buzz. <laughs> and that's when Buzz landed. So just down the road from our little weatherboard cottage was the Church Hall of the Revival Centres of Australia, Dubbo Branch. Um, it overlooked the river flats next to the Macquarie River. And my life basically moved between our house and this church and the houses of our fellow church members. There are about 50 or so people there. Um, they, all had they all had kids around the same time. Like my parents, a lot of them had um, found their own ways to the church, found their life partner inside the church, and then the baby boom began. So that meant that, as you can see on the stage here, that's me in the front right, I had a whole little universe of ready-made best friends. Um, we spent three or four days a week together. We had two midweek meetings. Um, we had Saturday activities where we'd put up rope swings on riverbeds or go camping or go to the Dubbo Zoo or put on play nights, shoot films, um, all kinds of activities, travel away for camps all around the country. And then on Sunday, we would have the very serious meetings, two of them, in fact. The first one would go for two hours um, during which, at a young age, we'd go out to Sunday school, learn all the blockbuster tales of David and Goliath and the creation story, Samson and Delilah, the list goes on. Um, and then we would have a break, and then we'd come back for a second meeting. So it was a very intense, but very close, loving, supportive community. I still have dreams of the fun nights we had when we'd have a meeting at someone's house and the parents would stay inside with their Arnott's or sorted biscuits and their cups of tea and us kids would be roaming around, playing around the playground, just freestyling and just being free and being kids in this safe, beautiful, supportive environment. And what set our church apart from um, all other churches, even other Pentecostal churches, was this unique doctrinal position. The man that started our church, Dr. Lloyd, uh, Pastor Lloyd Longfield, I just gave him a, an academic title there. Um, he certainly didn't deserve one. Um, he started this church in uh, 1948. Um, as is very common in the Pentecostal world, there are splits after splits within splits after splits. Every man and his dog starts his own church in that movement. And this man started his own. And to stake out, um, I guess, a, a unique competitive advantage, he came up with his own um, position that in order to be truly saved, you needed to speak in tongues. Now, this was a common practice in a lot of Pentecostals, but almost none of the other Pentecostal churches took it that one step further that you needed to have this experience to be saved. So for anyone who doesn't know what speaking in tongues is, um, it's something that happened in the Bible for the first time on the day of Pentecost, where um, Jesus' followers spoke out in these other tongues. Now, on that occasion, they actually spoke out in languages they'd never learned, but they were languages that people from other areas understood, um, which is known as xenolalia. And the other form of it is glossolalia, where you speak out in just a language that no one else understands, not even you. But the idea is that it's your direct prayer language to God. And so the Holy Spirit intercedes between your desires, thoughts, almost bypassing the linguistic system of our own languages that we learn to speak directly to God. So I don't remember the first time I was ever told that. This was just omnipresent in our lives. At the Sunday meetings, you would hear the adults do it. They'd stand up in the church 
and the men would speak out, often in a stronger voice, in these assertive, strong languages, almost sounding like Arabic or Hebrew, and then, you know, some of the women would stand up and speak out as well. Often it might sound softer, like a, a romantic language, like French, but they sounded like full-on languages, and so us kids were in awe of that. And this formed part of all of our parents' stories about how and why they came to the church. So, in the case of my parents, um, they'd lived really interesting lives before they joined the church. Um, my mum had grown up on um, beautiful grazing property in the Central West and then um, gone to a boarding school in Sydney, um, then became a bit of a party animal in Sydney, um, travelled through, this is in the 70s, through India and the Middle East, lived in Europe, then came home and met a friend who'd been in jail because of drugs and turned his life around because of the church. So that was enough to bring her into the Dubbo Assembly. Um, my dad had grown up in Adelaide, um, had a bit of a Christian upbringing, but it never kind of stacked up, never had much meaning. And he got called up into the army, didn't have to serve in Vietnam, but his life was kind of taken off his own sort of path of destiny. And he was a little bit lost, so he went and lived in Arnhem Land, uh, met some of um, the incredible Yungu people of that area, including the Unipingu family, who took him in and showed him the traditional ways of life. And so he had these amazing adventures as well, but again, um, it was his sister and her husband who were, um, had gone a bit too deep into the drugs as well and turned their lives around um, by joining this same church, the Revival Centre. So that's how my parents came to be there. And a lot of the other parents, who we called uncles and aunties, they had similar stories. So they would get up on Sunday and say, you know, this, this and this happened in my life. And, you know, all those stories that to us kids sounded kind of interesting. They were sort of portraying them as the dark days before they repented and found God. And here we all are happily ever after. And so the message was just omnipresent that at one point we would need to speak in tongues to be saved as well. But for us, there would be no <laughs> you know, wild years in King's Cross in the 70s or trips to India or, you know, those same sort of adventures that led my parents to this sort of dark place of turning around. Um, we would need to sort of live our lives in the church and one day speak in tongues. So there were a few little question marks there already for me because, like, what about my mistakes? What about my adventures? Oh, well, you're, you're lucky. You've been born into the one true church. I was like, hmm. Doesn't feel that lucky. <laughs> Feels a little bit boring. Um, it probably took me into my teens before I started to think like that. But before that, at the age of, say, six, seven, eight, we started to sort of get the message that we should start to think about seeking for the Holy Spirit. So right here, I'm probably about eight or nine going for a bushwalk out the back gate of my property with some church friends. Uh, we walked what, right over the ranges behind our property in Mudgee um, to another district. Just one of many beautiful adventures we had all the time. Um, but around this age, we started to have these seekers meetings where, all right, the kids will, will head out into the Sunday school room after the meeting and we'll get down on our knees and pray. And here's how you do it. You just repeat hallelujah, 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 praise the Lord. And when God chooses, when the moment's right, he's going to fill you up with his Holy Spirit and you're going to speak out in tongues like we do, us adults. And so slowly, some of our friends started to have that experience. Like, okay, oh, so Steve, Steve received. How long had he been seeking? Right, how old is he? Who was he praying with? And you sort of try to piece together the magic formula that made this moment happen. Um, <laughs> And so I had a younger brother, Sam, and he's 18 months younger than me, so very close. We have lived every moment of our lives together until we left home and have taken different adventures. And we were on a beautiful stony riverbank out the back of Mudgee, and uh, he was seven, I was nine, and I feel in this prayer meeting, this energy starts to come around Sam, my dad's praying around him, the noise gets louder, and boom, Sam's spoken in tongues. I was instantly skeptical, like, <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> Not that I swore in those days. I'm still terrible at swearing. It just doesn't, doesn't quite work for me. Um, 
Anyway, there was no room for skepticism. You know, this, this is what our, our lives were centered around. This was the, like the, the foundation of our walk in the Lord, the foundation of our lives. And so Sam spoke in tongues and it took me another year and a half till I had my moment. And so there I was at this beautiful children's camp um, down on the south coast of New South Wales at a place called Maria. And these camps were probably the, like the most beautiful experiences of our calendar. Just struggling to get to the next picture. Hmm. Oh, it's because I was pressing the wrong button. First keynote, told you it'd be a bumpy ride. <laughs> so we love these camps, they were amazing. So I was at one of these camps, 10 years old, south coast of New South Wales. Um, after the nightly meeting, all of us boys around the age of 10 went back to our cabin and had our nightly prayer session, probably the third prayer session we'd had that day to try and receive the Holy Spirit. And I felt like a bit of a warm feeling and I was saying my hallelujahs and then it, it felt like something changed in my mouth and the way that it was coming out. Like, maybe that, I think, I think that's it. So I didn't tell anyone that night. I wanted a confirmation from a very established source. So I waited till I got home to Mudgee. And as my dad came up one night to say goodnight, I said, Dad, I think I received the Holy Spirit at kids camp. He goes, okay, great. I was like trepidatious because I knew it needed to be real, you know? I needed to, I, this moment would be foundational. I knew that I'd be talking about it in hindsight for the rest of my life. And so I said, okay, show me. And so I prayed to him and said, look, it's not like yours and mum's, it's kind of a bit simple. He goes, no, that's okay, it can, it can develop. God can, you know, keep giving you more of the gift as it went on. And he said, there you go, you've received. I was like, okay. So the word spreads through the church. Tom, Tom received at Maria Kids Camp. He was down in his cabin one night. And so the narrative starts to set in. And that was all good to begin with. Um, but very quickly, um, the questions started to come up. So the next time I went to a Friday night prayer meeting, these were these meetings where we would pray for an hour. I thought, this is going to be great. The hour is going to go so much faster. I used to before receiving, look at my swatch watch and hope that it would end anytime soon, just like watching the second hand click around as the adults all pray. And I thought, this time I'm gonna be able to connect to God. Finally, I'm gonna like have this, you know, spiritual experience. I'm sure the hour will fly by. But very quickly as this meeting starts, I just hear this, my brother's voice in my head with his simplistic, fake sounding tongue. <laughs> like, he's faking it, he's faking it. And I'm there on my knees praying and I'm, I'm losing it. I'm getting really, really, really frustrated. And I start seething and then I realize people can hear me. And my dad stops the prayer meeting and goes, is someone crying? And I kept my head down. <laughs> no, no, all good, okay. And so from that moment on, that's the moment where the doubt kicked in for me. And I sat there just thinking, if he's faking it, maybe I'm faking it. And then I almost didn't dare to think this, but I was like, what if we're all faking it? Like this whole thing is a sham. Now I was able to just pull back from that preposis, preposis a little bit and my mind really settled on whether I was truly speaking in tongues or not. And if I could have like hit those doubts for six in that moment, I would have, but they would not go away. And so, I did my best to get on with my church life. That shot you saw of me in the baptism tank, I was happy to be there. This was a big moment. This was my sort of, the physical symbolism of my lifetime membership or eternal membership of this church and this path to salvation. But every now and again, the thoughts would just come back. Almost any time I got down to pray and speak in tongues, which we did almost daily, the doubts would be flying around in my head. But it wasn't something you could talk about, you know? This was our life. This was our church in Mudgee. We had about 30 odd people there. These people were like family. Then we were part of the bigger group, which had somewhere north of 5,000 members around the country. We'd go to camps in Adelaide, Melbourne. This was our world, you know? So to sort of come out and cast any kind of doubt 
on the key premise of our church, the thing that made it different, you know, for the word to go out that uh, Tom actually didn't speak in tongues, um, he wasn't sure and his dad got the confirmation wrong and this whole way that we're sort of getting our kids to receive the Holy Spirit is not really that solid. That was just something you couldn't talk about. So I didn't say anything. I just kept those doubts to myself right through my teenage years. It wasn't really an environment where you ask questions, not real questions. It wasn't an environment where you challenged anything. If you did raise a question, there was always a one-liner from the Bible that was able to, you know, oh, that's just, that's just man's thinking or trust in God or that's a question of faith or, you know, whether it was a direct quote from the Bible or just a saying that had developed in the church, you could actually never tell the difference as a kid because there'd just be these phrases coming at you about the way to push away your own thoughts and accept the Bible, but really what you were accepting was the interpretation of the Bible by our leaders. So this was a saying that was said at the end of any talk. Um, the, the speaker would get to the end and um, and all the people said, and the whole church would echo back, amen. I can see you guys smiling. I feel like you might have been in some of those meetings. Um, and that was, that was the culture of this organisation. This leader from Melbourne, Lloyd Longfield, who was, believe it or not, extremely charismatic, um, as religious leaders need to be. Um, and so the, there was no questioning at a local level up to the top. So... I did my best to get on with my life, and essentially I was walking in two worlds. I had this great community life in Mudgee, which my family encouraged, loads of sport, loved my rugby, was in the swimming club, cricket, drama, bands, music, everything at high school. But on the side of that, we had this super busy church life. So to my school friends, it's like, Tom's kind of normal, but yeah, he's, his family's pretty religious, and that was about as much as they knew. There were a few close friends that I sort of explained the whole thing to. And I think all up three friends from school came to my church, but they only ever came once. <laughs> and you'd be like, oh, I hope, that, I hope that bloke Frank from Dubbo doesn't turn up and shout in tongues in the middle of the meeting. You walk in there and I brought my friend um, Pete along to the church and I look around and there's Frank. I'm like, he's going to go for it, isn't it? <laughs> so it gets to that point of the meeting where they, they do the speaking in tongues bit and he blasts it at the top of his voice. I was like, oh God, I knew I shouldn't have brought my friends to this. Um, but because we were in a small church, because my dad was the pastor and actually in the scheme of things, my parents were fairly liberal. I found a balance that really worked for me throughout my school years. I could be committed to my faith and my church community, but relatively honest about who I was at school and lived a full, full life. Where it got harder for me was when I left school. And I went to Sydney. And for the first time in my life, I spent some time alone. You know? When you grow up in a family of four boys, busy sporting life, church life, you almost don't spend any time alone, like not a minute unless you want to. But there I was for the first time down in Sydney, this sort of nervous country kid studying commerce at Macquarie Uni. And for the first three days, I did not open my mouth to speak. I wondered if I would like forget how to talk, like literally walking around in silence, not knowing anyone. And it was here that the doubts started to get louder and louder. Once I was kind of lonely, a bit more vulnerable, more time on my hands. And also I joined the Sydney branch of the church, um, which was a lot more insular because it was bigger. So the people in the bigger branches like Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, they seemed to live their whole lives inside the church community where I'd managed to have this, you know, in community life and church life. And so the stakes kind of rose for me where I thought to myself, if I'm gonna live my whole life sort of inside this church community, I need this foundational experience to make sense. Like, I need to feel it. I need to feel what they're talking about. So there was a time um, in my first year of uni where I got home from uni, 
got on my mountain bike, rode down to the end of the street through the bush to this big um, waterway in Sydney called Pitwater, rode along and I saw this waterfall. I thought, I'm going to have a spiritual breakthrough right there. It's the perfect environment. Um, so I climb up to the top of this waterfall and I, for the first time, I just honestly say to God, look, I don't think I really speak in tongues. I'm going to be honest with you, God. I, I, don't, I don't think this is real, but I want it now. I want it badly. I want to be part of this. I wasn't a rebellious kid. I wasn't wanting to like go away from my family. I didn't want to go against my father. Um, I didn't want to go against the church. I didn't want to let go of all my friends. I wanted to be a part of it. I just started, I just got into my first relationship. We weren't allowed to have girlfriends until the age of 17. I finally hit 17. Still had to ask my dad, my local pastor, for permission to be in a relationship with this girl, but I'd finally got there. Um, and she was a big believer in the church. I don't think she had the same questions I did. But that was the life I wanted. We weren't allowed to have sex before marriage, but I didn't see that as a problem. I saw that as a good thing. I was on board. I thought it would be beautiful to be with someone who'd never been with someone else and to be able to share that for the first time. So I pushed in and I wanted it more, but I stood there on that waterfall and nothing happened. It was the same old thing. Me asking, thinking about all the stories I'd heard from everyone else and not getting the same deal. And so then it sort of started, to, I sort of started to struggle with the church. The rules started to annoy me a lot more. So on Saturdays at the big annual Youngies camp, where we'd all go away for the Australia Day long weekend, you'd sit there and we'd do the morals talk. They'd hand around these sheets of paper with all the rules. Started with the innocent stuff like uh, no rebellious t-shirts or worldly haircuts, um, which in the day was the undercut, which I still think is a great look, but maybe that's just because I wasn't allowed to have it in the t at the time. I really lent in into it in the 20 2010s, but anyway, it was a bit late then. <clears throat> and then it got through to the serious rules like if you fornicate, horrible word, isn't it? Um, you will be basically kicked out of the church permanently. So that was the real hard end of the wedge at our church. And when the pastor would read that out, it was so heavy, you know. Saturday afternoon, you're at Broken Bay on the Hawkesbury sitting there in between a game of touch and the evening meal, and you're sitting there with the pastor telling you, thou shalt not fornicate, you know. And you're sitting there thinking, what if one of us makes a mistake? Do we just have to, like, say goodbye, just boot you out of our lives? And evidently, yes. Um, I write about in the book, a friend of ours, Jarrah, <clears throat> and he, um, he made the mistake of getting a blowjob in year 11. And um, because they weren't of the age to marry and sort of re-enter the church, um, he was booted out permanently. And this was a childhood friend who we'd grown up with our whole lives. And Sam and I were just like, what? what? We, we can't call him. He's going to be going through the hardest time of his life alone. And it was horrible. It was disgusting. And we, we knew that. We could feel it. And we did stay in touch with him, even though that was against the rules. But all this stuff just sort of started to mount up. And I get this frustration. <clears throat> I'd be sitting there in that Saturday session, reading these rules, thinking, OK, I've got to comply with all of these controlling, intense, legalistic rules. But the foundational experience that meant to fuel the joy and the love and the faith isn't real for me. And so the clash of those two things was just a mess. So eventually it started to blow up with my partner and we were sitting at a 21st birthday. I call it a party, but you weren't allowed to call them parties in the church. It was as close as we got to a party. There was a live band and non-alcoholic punch and some you know, plastic chairs around the backyard. And we started sort of blowing up about the normal thing for us, which was, you're not being a good enough Christian. You need to try harder. You need to pray more. You need to read the Bible. And I just, I just had enough, and I just came out with it. I said, I'm just not sure I believe in any of this. And it was like someone had farted on the dance floor. <laughs> it's like the whole, the music, the party all ground to a halt. It was probably just in my head, but it felt like everyone was looking at us going, <clears throat> What has he just said to her to make her cry? Like in this environment, how could he possibly make making her cry? And so 
I got up and walked out of the party and sat in the front gutter out in this suburban Melbourne street. And one by one, my church friends came out. My, my best mate came out first. He said, mate, what have you done? <laughs> and I said, look, there's all that stuff with Kate, but really what's going on here is I'm not sure about the whole speaking in tongues thing. The first time I'd really put it out there to someone. And I said to him, what do you think? Is it real for you? And he said, look, I'll be honest with you. I question it sometimes too, but whenever I do that, I just see it as a, a crisis of faith and I just pray more and read the Bible more. Same advice I've been getting from my girlfriend. And I just sort of thought, and I, I loved this friend. He was, an, he was an epic, beautiful, empathetic person. And I thought, that's a great answer. It's honest. It's what we've been told. But that's actually a dangerous, logical sequence. Whenever you question something, you ignore it and just keep praying. I just... That just wasn't good enough for me. And so a series of people came out and I had these conversations with people. So for the first time, I was just putting it out there. Tom Tilly is questioning speaking in tongues in the revival center. And then next time I went to one of those youngies camps, the pastor came to approach me and yeah, it, it hit a bit of a crisis point. So I um, had six weeks between the end of uni and um, starting my full-time job at an investment bank. There's a whole career narrative that I probably won't have time for today, but thankfully, I ended up in journalism. Um, so I go on this overseas trip, and I'm, I go alone, and I backpack, and I've, I've never felt so lonely, never felt so exhilarated. Just started meeting people, met on a plane um, this Spanish woman who was a squatter living in Brixton in London, and an absolute rave-loving party animal and one of the beautiful, most beautiful, nicest people I'd ever met. She said, me and my friends are gonna drive from London, a bunch of Spanish people, we're gonna drive all the way to Madrid to see our parents for Christmas, wanna jump in the van. I'm like, yeah, why not? So there's me in my Quicksilver jacket with my matching Quicksilver watch, blonde hair, look like I'm straight off the northern beaches of Sydney, hanging out with these loose units, like just chaos on the Dover Ferry into Calais, Paris, through the Pyrenees, they're smoking spliffs, listening to Basement Jacks. This is early 2000s, by the way. Um, jumped in the van in Brixton, where's your head at? And initially I was so uptight and so wooden, and I just loosened up, and this trip just blew my mind. I just thought, I don't have to be this careful, cautious kid, you know? I still believe that God is watching me, but I don't, I don't truly believe he cares about all these rules and these divisions and all this negativity. And I also met this amazing Scottish guy on the trip who was a total mess, but he was a true believer in Christ. So we sat down and he, he talked about the compassionate, loving side of Jesus Christ, looking after the poor, um, the sick, the hungry, um, tanking on the religious authorities of the day. And it just painted this alternative vision and I realised I'd been locked into this binary. It was, as I'd been taught, hedonism, selfish destruction, or the revival sent away to salvation and nothing in between. And realising that there was this vision of the gospel that was way more compassionate and way more interesting and way more beautiful and exciting. I thought, well, there is another way. There's a third way here. I can still be a good person without the Revival Center. This is me getting drunk for the first time ever. <laughs> the clock has just ticked over midnight onto my 21st birthday. I'm on the way home from the European trip and that bloke next to me who I've never met before tells the hosties, this guy's just turned 21. Next minute, six pack of mini champagnes turn up. I'm like, do I tell them I don't drink? <laughs> nah, stuff it, it's my birthday. So, lay into the mini champagnes, hopefully you can just see it there. Um, didn't realize I was drunk till I stood up to go to the toilet and I'm like wandering around the plane like this. And so that's me about to come home to confront the most painful, inconvenient truth you could ever raise in my family and my church. At that point, I was still lost in the euphoria of John the Scots version of Jesus and the Spanish ravers, and I was going to live my life out here. But as soon as I got home, 
I went to my 21st birthday party and all the people that I love from the church, including my whole family, were there. And that's when I realized this is going to be a lot harder than I, I expected, like to turn away from these people who love me, who I love them, who are great people, who are actually the only people that probably truly understand who I really am and where I've been from. And then how's that going to fit with my family? My dad's a pastor, you know, four boys, all fully invested in this community, this doctrinal position, this church. And that's where it got harder. And so my relationship with Kate fell apart instantly because um, I'd travelled with this other girl on holidays and completely compromised my ethics, but I'd it was basically like cheating, but I'd drawn all these strange lines, like not kissing, and it was, it was a mess. That blew up my relationship. Next weekend, my brother and I thought, let's go to the Mardi Gras. <laughs> and so we go and have this amazing night at the Mardi Gras, and we turn up to church the next week, and um, at the end of the, the, the session, the last song, the pastor's at the pulpit and goes, oh, just before you head off, could um, Sam and Tom Tilly just please meet us after the meeting over here? <laughs> Like, and I didn't know what it was about. I thought, well, <clears throat> I've crossed all manner of lines over the last few months overseas, but Sam wasn't on the trip, so we get in and it turns out it's the Mardi Gras. So we get, we get suspended from the church for the Mardi Gras, and I thought, great, <laughs> I'm out. But then it got much, much, much harder. I, I got out to start with, and then this, in all of these organisations, there's the hardliners, the guys who think they're the warriors for the organisation. And this guy brought me back into the church. He told me, you are causing so much grief and pain to your family, and you know what? You've never given it 100%. Can you tell me you've given it 100%? And I thought, well, look, yeah, there's been times where I've been selfish or done the wrong thing or where I haven't you know, spent every day praying. And I guess, yeah, you could technically argue I haven't given it everything. So well, look what you're throwing away. And so I thought, well, maybe this, is, maybe this is the spiritual breakthrough. Maybe this is my moment of humility that I need. And so I, I decided to go back. And then when that blew up, they came down a lot heavier on me. And the next time I infringed the rules, I got booted out of my own share house. And that's when my world just fell apart. I felt dislocated from my family. They no longer understood my point of view. Um, I'd started this new relationship with this girl who was in Europe and I was thinking about going over there. My career wasn't working. And I'd set up this share house that I was living in. You know, I was a, I was a 21 year old kid. And so I was booted out of my house and had to find somewhere else to live. And that's when it really started to kick. And I got this pain in my heart and I assumed it was from God. I went to do some training in London for my job and I was walking around the streets with this physical soreness in my heart and I tried to think my way through it. I'm thinking, all right, well, maybe I've done the wrong thing here and I need to, all right, what if I apologize to the church leaders, apologize to my father, come back, give it, give it 100%. And then I thought, yeah, sure, but I know how that story ends. It's me at the waterfall again, needing the spiritual experience to make it make sense. And then I went down the other pathway. All right, what if I just tell them all to get stuffed? I'm going to stay here in Europe, quit my job, start a life here, um, shack up with this new girlfriend, live, live this big, beautiful life here in Europe where the dream sort of began. And I thought, that's all good, but no matter how well that goes, if I'm not at peace with my own family, I'll never be happy. Wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, that is not going to work. And that's where I came back to that third vision I'd seen in Barcelona. I thought, I need to find God in other places. So I went on this journey, came back to Sydney. Um, I went to a church in London. I went to a church once in Costa Rica. I started just looking for all these other churches. And that's when I explored the rest of the Pentecostal world as well. So I went to this big mega church on Sydney's northern beaches. Um, sort of raised my hands and did the full Pentecostal experience for the first time. And I was like, I wonder if anyone's going to see me from my old church here. You know, I had all this kind of like double thinking going on. 
And I eventually went to this smaller one and I'd finally worked out what I needed to ask this guy. It's like, do you have to speak in tongues to be saved? I finally worked out the question I needed to understand amongst all of this noise. And this is kind of my journey with, with truth that I want to talk to you about today, that it just came in little fragments over many years. And it's only afterwards that you can actually piece it together and see it as a cohesive narrative. But it, this was a key turning point where this guy just calmly explained that that was an absolute misinterpretation of the Bible and that ours was the only group in Australia, apart from one other, that held on to that belief. And I said to him, so does, what does that mean about your church and the way you see all the other churches, like the other big one down the road or the Anglican? Do you think they're all wrong and you're right? And he's like, no, we, we do stuff with those guys. They're great. They're just, they're just doing Christianity in a way that works for them. But really, it all boils down to, do you love and follow Jesus? So that, that church had its problems as well. The, the Pentecostal movement, I found, even though you didn't have to speak in tongues, those experiences and the falling over and all these different things, they still weren't happening for me. So I, I still felt like I didn't get the full package and that was that same horrible feeling I'd had as a kid. So I ended up going to this Anglican church and this is where the moment of truth finally came. There was this really cool youth pastor, Pastor Tony, and he had this lovely wife, Meg, and she got up and gave her testimony and these were smart, successful, um, community engaged, charitable, good Christian people. I liked everything about the way they lived out their beliefs. And she just talked about how much she loved Jesus and that he was her savior and like her friend and her role model. And I sat there and I thought, I don't feel that way. I actually don't. And then I started to cascade through all these questions like, well, do I really believe that that story about Jesus being the son of God, that he was resurrected? Do I believe the creation story or this whole narrative that God created human beings to sin and then have to sort of turn back to him? It's like, why did he pre-program us to sin? You know, this, this just, and it's like, I don't believe it. And finally, I'm sitting there in this Anglican church on the Manly Corso in Sydney, just thinking, I now finally know what, a real Christian is, it's, it's a lot like Meg and Tony, people that truly see Jesus as their role model, their hero and their saviour. And I just thought, I don't believe it. And I don't think I ever did. And it was like there'd been a car crash and I was expect, inspecting the damage inside my own internalised thoughts. Am I, am I feeling like a tension, a, a dissonance? like a pain. I was like, no, this is just sitting so calmly. There's no more noise in my mind. I feel really at peace with this. And that was it for me. I'd finally got to the end of this journey of discovering what the truth was in terms of my beliefs. And it was such a relief. And I walked out of that church knowing that I wasn't a Christian. And that was not what I expected. You know, I'd spent years trying to find the right church. And once I family, finally found it, I realized that I actually didn't believe in the core premise of the whole thing, let alone the speaking in tongues and all the guidelines and no, no rebellious haircuts, you know. I, I actually, it didn't work for me. So that was the beginning of a whole new chapter of my life where I'd cleared away the building blocks that had been given to me through the circumstances of my birth and started again. And that was a whole nother very tough journey. I had all this freedom but nowhere to go with it. I'd come home from, from work at night and I have no one to hang out with. I'd lost my, my friends. I was estranged from my family for a time. I lost my beliefs. I'd lost the sort of plan for my life, you know. All of that upbringing came with a structure of what would happen one thing after the next. You know, you'd go to uni and you'd probably get married sometime before 30 and have a baby and this would be your community and you live on from there and you've got your career and it all kind of works as a structure, but it was all completely gone. And so I quit my job at the bank and I spent a year away. I traveled through Africa for a few months and then I lived in Amsterdam and I continued on with that relationship 
and tried to piece my life together, but with things that were truthful for me. And because I was trying to have a career reinvention as well, it was also about all that stuff. So I started, I only started doing things that made sense and resonated for me. So I started volunteering at this crazy radio in a squatted old bank vault in Amsterdam. Um, I learned how to edit video. Um, I was playing music and I just sort of started rediscovering my passions. And so that's where my sort of journey started to move forward, but just only putting the blocks on my wall that made sense for me. And I came back to Sydney and I was on the dole initially and it was very hard piecing a career together, but slowly but surely, because it, it was truthful and resonant for me, it came together and then eventually I got a job at Triple J, started meeting a lot more friends, living in the inner city of Sydney, finding my way, fitting in, and I found a career that had meaning for me and my identity started to form as well. But this all took years, you know? And so finding my truth was only the start of that journey. And then it just built from there. And <laughs> somehow I ended up topless touring the, touring the country, slapping the base. Um, and so that journey for me was just incredible and hard at times and lonely at times, but ultimately it's been incredibly rewarding. And so being truthful about what I really believed in unlocked my life. And then the other question whenever I share this story is, what happened to your family? And as you can tell, my family means a lot to me. And so that was a key question. And I, I, I took this course of action taking the risk that we would have a very strange relationship for many years and decades to come, you know? My dad had poured everything into the church. He was a true believer. But a surprising twist came, and he ran afoul of the leadership as well, and had his pastorship stripped away for him, for wait for it, attending the wedding of an ex-member. Unbelievable. And this, this guy that got married was a childhood friend of ours. And my dad thought, I know I'm not supposed to go to this wedding, but I can't justify not going. And that was the final straw. He'd been pushing against the edges for too long. And so one by one, the whole family had their own moment of reckoning with the church. But I'd gone first. And ironically, when my dad was hurting the most after being kicked out, I was the person he could turn to for understanding. And, you know, we had these amazing moments and he said, I'm, I'm sorry that you had to go through this alone. And yeah, from the time I left for the next five years, everyone else found their truth and left as well. And look at this. <laughs> Many years later, but four boys, wives, partners, babies, and by me being honest about my own truth, it helped the rest of the family find their truth with it as well. And now we don't have those, those barriers and estrangement. And I guess the overarching theme here is that at that, that tricky point of me deciding whether or not to confront these doubts that have been in my head for 10 years, the painful process of being honest about those doubts and bringing it out, the costs were right there. I could see exactly what I was losing, but it's so much harder to see the benefits. But they have been infinite. Once you start with real truth that the building blocks on your wall are there for a reason, you can build a much stronger wall. And so it helped me unlock my own freedom. It helped our family find a much more truthful set of beliefs and not to be divided by religion. And then I guess the other benefit I could never have seen from back there was what it's like to share this story now in a book. So I, I hope that putting this in a book um, would give people hope who grew up in a similar church. And I thought our experience was quite niche, you know. It's within the Christian movement, it's in the Pentecostal movement, it's in a small part of it, you know. It's, it's a very, very, it's an experience that directly not that many people have had. But I have just been blown away by how many people are getting in touch with me with messages like this.
or this. And it's people from all walks of life. Um, my editor said it, for her, it was like her story of coming out as a lesbian. It's the same dynamics. It's these internalized truths that we're scared to share because of fear it will cut us off from our community and the people we love, you know? And that's, that's hectic, that's horrible. And then there's the trade-off again, like in my story, you know? What's the price gonna be? Pretty big. What are the benefits? Don't know, my first time at life here. This is my first draft, you know? And so to think that it's, 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 it's just so powerful. And you know, I've done all this journalism where you sort of research and generalize, whereas this book, I didn't go and find other people's stories or do this wide ranging, it's not, it's not a research book. It's a very personal story. I've stuck to my own narrative. And that sort of deeply personal truth seems to resonate even more deeply than that broader kind of storytelling. <coughs> Stuff like this. And it's just blown my mind. This is probably one of my favorites, this guy. So some of these people have been turning up to my talks and just going, thank you for saying this. I felt like no one's shared this story before. And that surprised me, because I know people have written books about coming out of the Pentecostal movement, but there's something about seeing your own experience reflected in that way that is unlocking something for people. And this is a, a benefit I never saw coming from facing up to my own truth. If you know the 10-year-old me in that prayer meeting with those intrusive doubts could have looked forward 32, 31 years um, and seen this, it just, I don't think he could have comprehended it. This one, this one really means a lot to me because what this tells me about facing up to your truth and paying the price for it is that when you can't be truthful, you feel alone. You feel isolated. But like, like this woman who I actually knew from growing up, we were all thinking it, you know? We were actually all in it together. But because of the culture of this environment, None of us felt like we had the freedom to open up and talk to each other about it. But as soon as you do, and you open up to that truth, you can be connected again. And like, that's the amazing power of truth because after food, water, shelter, social connection is basically the next most important thing. It's crucial for happiness. And I think as we as a society learn more about mental health, we just know that one of the foundations, apart from those basics plus plus sleep, which we all understand a bit better now, especially me as a young parent. <laughs> um, that, that connection is what it's all about. So that's my story, guys. Um, it was about seeing the cost, not knowing the benefits, stepping out, and this is how it worked out for me. And I don't want to be, I guess, too, you know, there's a danger in over-interpreting over other people's stories and um, extrapolating them onto your own. But this is my story, and thanks so much for listening. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I've gone a little bit over, but we want to take a couple of questions. Yeah, I'd love to hear any thoughts anyone has. Y yep. So many people. Oh. Yeah. Do you think anything should happen to um, stop the church from being so manipulative and coercive? Or do you think that's just um, a part of religion? Yeah, great question. Um, no, I don't think there should be any kind of direct intervention. And so I went through a, an interesting journey of sort of ending up in this sort of liberal media world of working at the ABC and Triple J, where most people are atheists and think, you know, that religious people are a little bit crazy, whereas given where I'd come from, I'm like, no, there's so many amazing people in there and amazing faith-inspired works. And there's often debates about like intervening on stuff like gay conversion therapy, which you know, has been outlawed in some states. Um, but I still believe in religious freedom and I think it's, it's really important. Um, and so you know, there, there does have to be a line where it becomes like criminal activity, um, where maybe the laws of 
our societies do have to get involved. Um, but no, in the case of this church, I absolutely, absolutely defend their freedom to keep doing what they do. I feel sorry for the children who are, who are part of it, who are going to be forced into the same questioning that I was and potentially feel really alone. But um, all they have to do is read my book. <laughs> and I, actually, that goes to my point. I prefer culture to change things rather than laws and police and intervention and, and conversations and education. That's how I like to do things. Yeah. Hello. Sorry, I've been told to stand, so I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tom, for your story. Um, I can resonate in terms of being, or I guess, getting to a space of stepping fully into yourself and trusting that intuitive guidance mm. despite the fear of the church. Mm. But how would you say you've now transitioned into the space you are of having peace, of, the, of feeling the peace, I guess, the church says you should feel in believing those ideologies? How has that transitioned for you and what are your, I guess, beliefs or what's your faith yeah. um, around a higher power, around spirituality and things of that sort? Yeah, thanks so much for that question. So that's where I had to do a bit of rebuilding as well. It's like, what, where is my, my deeper sustenance? And that was one of the things I liked about the church, you know, in a small country town, it was sort of seemed to be all about footy, beers and watching TV. And the one thing I liked about the church was we were going for something deeper, you know, something that connected us to the purpose of, of living. And so I haven't sought to replace that exactly one for one, but I, I believe that science gives us probably the best explanation to why we're here. But I know that it's not a great explanation and there's massive, massive gaping universe-sized holes in our understanding of what the hell we're, we're doing here and why we happen to be part of, you know, this crazy species. Um, but I, for me, that's, that's a beautiful thing, the not knowing. So I try and enjoy that, you know, because that's what keeps it exciting. And then I guess I also, I get this kind of like deep kick when I read good history and I feel that the experiences we're having in this moment in history are connected all the way back, you know? Um, I really enjoyed reading a bit of history like, um, say, Sapiens by Yuval Harari, an amazing book, which when I feel connected to history, that's when I feel this deep sense of humanity. And then I, I'm in love with mountains and I love doing anything up in those big mountains and just feeling this awesomeness and the power of this, this place that we're living. So that's the kind of mix for me. Um, I believe big time in community, which is something that I took from the church and loved about the church and realized later on in life that I was working hard to find in other places. Um, and just good, good ethics. And some of the Bible teaching on that are awesome, treating your neighbor as yourself. Like that's the foundation of equality, you know? Great ideas and checking the power balances of, of the rich versus the poor and those vested interests. So, yeah, you can take the good from Christianity, all those things, dash of science and a bit of um, awe of the unknown and the beauty of this world, and that's where I land, roughly. Thank you. Just okay, minute. two more, yeah, yeah. And then we're going to... Um, I'm going to... There's some, I've got some of my books out there if anyone wants to come up and say good day afterwards. Am I on? Or is it someone else? Okay, I guess I'm on. Tom, I've got, got a, a hand up um, very, very straight right here. Or is there another one? Do I go first or? All right. G'day, Sorry man. about that. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, I've got to ask, how much do you think that uh, Christianity is starting to influence right-wing politics in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> if you'd asked me a few weeks ago, I might have been a bit uh, less comfortable about it, but the election result maybe sort of calmed any fears. Look, I'm not, I'm not that worried about it, to be honest. I think, I think there is a slight over-representation. Um, there was in Scott Mar Morrison's inner circle of, of Pentecostals, but I actually didn't see a huge amount of that flowing into his politics. Yes, he was a social conservative, didn't support same-sex marriage, etc. But I, I don't think it's that bad. I, I think 
you've got to have some religious people in our democratic system, that's representation. Half of Australians are still Christians, or they say they are at the census at least. A lot of those five million Catholics don't go to church, um, and the 250,000 Pentecostals all do. Um, so that's part and parcel of our, our democratic society and where we've come from, you know, these, these Western countries, they were largely Christian, so it's still going to be a huge part of who we are, and lots of it's good, as well as some of the more concerning, socially conservative things. I think it's more of a concern in America, but I'm not so worried about it here. Yeah, I think we... Last, last one. Uh, I'm sorry to everyone else, but I'll be up there if you need to chat. Thank you so much for having the courage to share your story. I felt like you were telling mine right down to the basement Jack story in London, <laughs> like to the, to the word. Yeah, right. I've also recently had children later in life. Oh, wow. I'm interested to hear what you're going to teach your children about spirituality and God. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I don't want him to read my memoir too early because there's some pretty saucy stuff in there. Um, I'm still working it out, you know, it's, and it's a collaboration between me and my partner who, who grew up with, um, you know, a dad who was a scientist and a very different worldview to mine. So there's a, there's a sort of live collaboration happening right there. I, I expect I'll be very liberal, but with a lot of knowledge, hopefully. So when I'm trying to explain something, I want to have reasons for it, why you can and can't do something, you know, real reasons, not like, because the Bible said, or because I say so, you know, but I don't know if it's going to be that easy, you know, how, how you can actually get down to that level of detail with a four-year-old. Um, so yeah, my, my, my hunch is that I'll stray towards being quite a liberal parent, um, but I want them to have an amazing education and I want them to have some of the things that the church offer me, like a great community, um, great friends. I want them to meet people who won't necessarily drop right into their, um, their wherever they happen to be, their social class or whatever, you know. We met people from all walks of life and my parents made sure of that and I think it made us better people. So there's some things I want to borrow from it, put into a more liberal framework, sort of um, bolstered by reason and knowledge. Yeah. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much for coming down, everyone. I really appreciate it. <laughs>